So welcome everybody. We are really excited to be starting a new series this morning. In this series, we're gonna be, like I said, exploring both our humanity and our sexuality. And this has been something that the folks who are gonna be uh, speaking during this series have really wrestled over in order to treat this with truth, but also with gentleness and respect. So as Gary comes up today, our senior pastor comes up today to lead us off in this series, would you please continually pray for him that God would speak through him in this series? Would you welcome Gary, please? Oh, I still remember vividly the first time that I encountered pornography. I was probably 11 years old and I was walking home from my grandmother's house to my parents' house, about a tenth of a mile on a country road. And there on the side of the road was a magazine. And I picked it up and instinctively opened it. And upon seeing what was inside and the images inside, something stirred within me, a whole host of feelings and emotions that I was completely unprepared for. There was a sense of wonder. There was a sense of deep curiosity and longing and almost like, for lack of a better term, like appetite. But right very quickly on the heels of that came this crashing wave of feelings like, this is wrong. Almost a dirtiness, a shame, guilt. I took the magazine and I brought it home. I hid it. I looked at it again. And then I did perpetually what Adam and Eve did in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. I kept it hidden. At some point, my parents discovered, I don't remember how all that went down, uh, and there was some punishment, there was a lot of conversation. It was the first time in my life that I had really encountered the brokenness of our sexuality. And I don't think at that time there, was, uh, there were good tools to help articulate both the gift of sexuality and its brokenness. And so even to this day, and this isn't uniquely a male problem, but uniquely to this day in light of that experience, even today there are things in my life and accountable relationships and so forth that are designed to protect me from me. In my yard, my backyard, there's a half-dead tree. It's an oak tree. It's a white oak, and it grows up, and it symmetrically, beautifully forks into a right fork, left for you, I guess, and a left fork. And, and on one side, the tree produces a full canopy of leaves, and it drops acorns this time of year, late summer, early fall. The other side of the tree is completely dead, such that over the last several weeks, really the last year, periodically, it's dropping branches. And I think that tree provides a really appropriate metaphor uh, as we approach this topic of not just our sexuality, but even who we are as human beings, but expressed sexually. And that is that sex is God's good gift to us. It's a vehicle for our flourishing. It's a vehicle vehicle for intimacy. It illustrates uh, the power of the relationship that God has between himself and his church. But at the same time, it's broken. It's flawed. It's filled with death. And the confusion in our understanding of our sexuality kind of enters into trying to discern what is what. And so a large part of what we want to do over these five weeks, a few things in terms of our pastoral heart for this message, is that we want to present truth from a biblical point of view and really challenge the cultural narratives that are so loud in our lives. But we also want to equip you and ourselves as a church to be able to have a, a, a good conversation, redeeming conversations with those in your world who might uh, struggle with all manner of things related to this topic, as we do. As we do. And so uh, this morning, I'm gonna, my first big point for us to wrestle with uh, as we start today is we are all theologians. Or let me ask it to you this way. Would you consider sort of stepping into this journey as a fellow theologian? You see, uh, theology is simply thoughts about God. And I dare say, I think we all have thoughts about God. No matter where you stand or if you're watching online today, we all have thoughts about God. And so in a practical sense, we're all theologians. But in this series in particular, we're going to look at 
uh, biblical theology. We're going to look at what the world believes from a philosophical point of view, and we're going to wrestle with some hard things. And so I would encourage you to put on your theologian's cap, whatever that looks like, and step into this, this journey uh, with us. Now, to do that, Whenever we're talking about ideas, uh, big ideas from a framework of either philosophy or theology or whatever it might be, every single one of us, secular or Christian, religious or irreligious, come to those conversations with a, with a set of assumptions. And as we are in church, we also come to these conversations with a set of assumptions. So I'll give you just two core assumptions that we're making this morning and then two uh, core sort of pillars of revelation uh, to that end. So two core assumptions. We assume uh, that if you're in this room, you're submitting to the idea or at least gathered into a people who believe that God exists and that he's personal. One of our core assumptions here is we believe uh, God is real, he exists, and he is personal. Secondly, we believe he's knowable and has revealed himself through two principal means of revelation. The first being his word, the Bible. And the second being his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 tells us that in the past, God revealed himself through the prophets and the apostles, but in these last days, he's revealed himself by his son. So I want to look at these in turn. Again, sort of under this idea that we're all theologians, our first big point is as theologians in church, we're, we are going to uh, approach this as though the Bible is authoritative to this conversation. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verse 16, tells us all Scripture, the full canon of biblical Scripture, is, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, teachable, it's inspired, rather. It's God-breathed. It's given to us to be useful, practical, profitable, teachable. For what? To teach us, to instruct us about who we are as humans and what our sexuality is for. To rebuke us for wrong behavior in our own lives, in this area of sexuality. To correct our thinking in line with what God has to say about it in regards to our sexuality. And proactively, as it were, to train us to godliness, even in this area. So uh, to say it, to belabor the point, we believe the Bible is actually authoritative in these areas, even on this topic. Secondly, and by the way, uh, it's really tempting to go off on a huge tangent right now because I know the question that some of you are wrestling with is, well, how do I know this is authentic and real and can be authoritative in my life? For the sake of keeping this message within today's time frame, uh, please go to our website or our YouTube page. Uh, last fall in September, we preached a series called Tough Questions, and Pastor Zach addressed this question of the reliability and authenticity of Scripture. So start there if you have questions about the, the Bible itself. Our, our second thing, the Bible's authoritative. The incarnation is foundational. What do I mean by that? The, the nature of who God is, uh, specifically expressed in the second person of the Godhead, the coming of Jesus Christ, what theologians would call Christology, the study of Christ, a right understanding of Christology is foundational to a right understanding of anthropology. That is the study of humanity. And, and so as an aside here, you're going to hear us use the term theological anthropology probably nearly every week. And, and don't be blown away by the big words. Essentially, what we're talking about there is theology is thoughts of God. Anthropology is the study of humanity. So it's the study of humanity as we relate to God on the topic of sexuality. Hope you're still tracking. <laughs> Theological anthropology. So we're studying this, and what we're saying, and we're going to come back to this in a little more detail later, is that the incarnation, Christ's coming, is foundational to this understanding. So a couple of anchor scriptures on this point. Malachi 3, verse 1. God the Father says, see, I'm going to send my messenger. He's talking here, we learned later, about John the Baptist. And he will prepare the way before me. This is really the first place where God drops this huge hint that the promised Messiah, the Savior, the anointed one, who'd been promised all through the Old Testament, was actually going to be God himself who came. And that John the Baptist would be the forerunner to himself. Paul the Apostle in the New Testament writes an entire letter refuting false understandings about who Jesus is in his nature. The book is called Colossians. And his argument reaches its apex in chapter 2, verse 9, where he says this, for the entire fullness of God's nature or his deity dwells bodily in Christ. 
John the Apostle in his letter confronts the, some of these same ideas. And John says this, he says, listen, we heard him, we saw him, we touched him, the eternal life of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. I'm paraphrasing John's words a little bit. In other words, John says, this is an apparition, we weren't deceived, it wasn't a, a cult. No, we, we bore witness to him with our senses that he was God in the flesh. Why is this important? A biblical ethic of our humanity and sexuality is incarnational. Knowing God's nature and specifically Christ's nature is foundational. We are made in the image of God to reflect the character of God, not only in our psyche and our mind and our thinking, but how we flesh that out in our real lives with our actual bodies. Why? Because theology informs worldview, which informs thinking and behavior. You're going to hear that a lot this morning. Theology informs worldview, which informs thinking and behavior. So our third point, number one, the Bible is authoritative. Uh, the incarnation is foundational. A Christian worldview, a biblical worldview, is reasonable. Is reasonable. The case that we're going to make this morning, this morning's a little unique in that I'm not going to uh, tackle one of our four categories of sexuality, but we're going to be looking at a foundation, a theology of the body that will come back to you through the series, that will anchor, anchor our understanding for why the world thinks the way that they do about, in these areas of sexuality and why a biblical worldview is different. But here's the case we want to make today. We're making the case that a biblical worldview is a better way. It's a better way, it provides a better way to engage with ourselves and our world. Now, I really wrestled with kind of in, in, uh, capturing the, the essence, the big thought for today, right? That the biblical worldview provides a better way to engage our world. I really wrestled with the word engage uh, because I think you could use the word uh, understand, uh, and, and a bunch of other things. But engage, it has all that wrapped into it. How we perceive our world, how we interact with our world, how we interpret our world, all of that is in view here. That a biblical worldview, we're gonna make the case today, uh, is a better way to do all of that, for us to engage our world. So we're kind of going broad, high-level theology of who we are as people and human beings. And then the messages that come each week over the next four will explore this idea more specifically in different areas of our sexuality. So before we jump in to the deep end this morning, I want to give you uh, one additional resource to consider uh, as, we, as we pursue this idea of being theologians together. Um, and it's, called, it's a book called Love Thy Body. It's by a woman named uh, Nancy Piercy. Nancy Piercy is one of the preeminent uh, female intellectuals within the church, within evangelicalism in particular. And uh, Nancy Piercy came to know Jesus uh, out of an agnostic background. She was in academia, is an extremely, extremely bright woman. And uh, she wrote a book called uh, Total Truth, and then did research in this area of our humanity and sexuality and wrote this book, Love Thy Body. Now, we want to do something a little bit different in this series that we've never done here, to my knowledge, uh, at GBC. Uh, each week, we're going to share a resource with you, and then we're going to give away that resource to one of you in the service. And so I want to tell you a little bit more about this, and then it's going to be sort of a first come, first serve, and I'm just going to hand it to you. Uh, why do we want to do that? One, we want to put good books in the hands of our people. Uh, and Nancy Piercy's book is really the, the resource that will, that will connect all five weeks, and yet will highlight a specific resource uh, in each week in particular. Uh, this particular book is pretty comprehensive. Uh, it's thorough. It's provocative. Uh, and it's a challenging read. And so as you prepare to hear these five weeks, uh, if you are interested, I'm going to invite you to come get it. But one caveat, please do not take this if you're not actually going to read it. Okay? So who would like it? First come, first serve. You can come right up and grab it. And don't, like, hurt each other if you... Okay. <laughs> yes. Can we hand that back to her? Right straight back? Thank you so much. Awesome. So, yeah, listen... We've never done this, a little awkward and clunky. Get used to it, we're doing it every week. Uh, we've got some great resources. So in light of that, there is a green sheet at the Welcome Center that has a list of about 10 or so additional resources. We encourage you to start reading, start studying, uh, ask hard questions. We're all theologians, as it were. 
All right, so let's begin to wrestle with this idea of who we are as human beings. And we're going to contrast really two worldviews uh, around this idea of theological anthropology. We're going to ask the question, are we two-part beings or are we embodied souls? Now, the worldview that we're first looking at is what's called the two-story view. And we're going to contrast that with what we'll call God's grand design this morning. The two-story view sort of introduces us uh, to Francis Schaeffer, C.S. Lewis, and Nancy Piercy. We'll, we'll read a little bit of, of her uh, book. And in her study and research after coming to faith in Jesus Christ, Nancy Piercy began to note striking parallels of thought in theology and in academia and philosophy and so forth uh, around this idea of truth and morality and personhood and all of this stuff. Now, before we look at the two-story view, and we'll give you some visuals to help you, uh, you know, sort of grasp that, it's important to remember that before modern times, there was an understanding that there was like the natural material world, and then there was sort of the world of morals and values. But that was understood to be uh, an integrated whole. And so uh, ancient and pre-modern uh, religions and cultures would often uh, act out spiritual things in very physical ways, even in some cultures and religions with self-harm to the physical body as connected to their understanding of the spiritual realm. And so that was very common. Uh, it was only really through uh, beginning with the Enlightenment and the advent of modern science uh, that which is physically tangible is able to be measured and observed and tested in a lab uh, that the, the physical, the temporal, the material began to be viewed as one realm and truth and morals and values and so forth began to be viewed in an entirely separate realm. Now, Francis Schaeffer, who was a, a Christian thinker and, and philosopher of the last century, really the 60s, 70s, and 80s, came up with this visual aid. Uh, it's, a, it's an illustration of a two-story building to visualize this concept of uh, truth in two different stories, an upper story and a lower story. So you see theology, uh, morality uh, is denoted as being sort of private. It's kind of your thing. It's this idea of your truth versus my truth, right? It's, it's subjective. It, it, it doesn't apply to everyone. It's relativistic. Uh, whereas science, which is measurable, testable, observable, and so on, is objective, even public, and, and really valid for everyone. And so this thought begins to take shape. And Piercy, in her research, noted that there's a similar dichotomy in academia known as the fact-value split. And so you can see that illustrated in this way. That again, values and moral judgments, even things like love and religion, and so on and so forth, are in that upper story. It's subjective. It's a matter of preferences and opinions. Whereas facts, things like mathematics and, and observations of science, are public, objective, and valid for everyone. These fundamental ideas are how the world, generally speaking, thinks. Well, this really over the last 30 years uh, began to influence what has become known today as personhood theory. This is sort of the next iteration of it. You'll see represented here. It's this idea that uh, my person, uh, who I am as a person, uh, my psyche and my thoughts and feelings and all of that is in that upper story and is determined by me. And whereas my body, my physicality, if you will, is in the lower story. What's interesting about all this is these, I, I referenced the Enlightenment. These ideas actually way predate, predate the Enlightenment. We were joking a little bit with a quip this week and saying these ideas aren't actually very enlightened. They, they come way before that. They're ancient, in fact. Uh, we see uh, very similar ideas that became, uh, were early ideas even around the Bible times that then became fully developed into a false teaching known as Gnosticism. Now, I yanked these, uh, the next set of notes I'm going to share with you here right out of the NIV Study Bible. I referenced Colossians and 1 John earlier. Both of these books, one by Paul and one by John the Apostle, were written to refute false teaching about the nature of Jesus to the early church. And while it wasn't known as Gnosticism, purely speaking, at the time, the ideas that existed as early as A.D. 60, uh, by the second and third centuries, were uh, what we'd call full-blown Gnostic thought. And so here are some of the fundamental ideas of Gnosticism, and note how closely they resemble the fact-value split and personhood theory and so on and so forth. Number one, matter is evil, but spirit is good. 
Uh, that is, the human body, which is matter, is, 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 uh, is evil, just intrinsically, and it's to be contrasted with God, who is spirit and is therefore good. Matter is evil, spirit is good. That's the belief that Gnosticism holds. Number two, salvation does not come by faith in Christ, but by special knowledge. Salvation is escaping from this matter, escaping from the body. And so this leads to all kinds of new age thought and belief, huge influence by the Greeks here that we won't get into, uh, but a special or even secret knowledge, not faith, but knowledge. Greek word is gnosis, where we get this idea of Gnosticism. Well, this theology impacted what people believed about God. Consequently, Jesus Christ was not God because if matter is evil, Christ certainly could not have had a physical body. And so now some interesting uh, theological thoughts developed about Christ's humanity and deity. One said that Christ didn't have a body at all, uh, that he was or only seemed to have a body. He appeared to have a body, and this was called docetism. The opposite view was that Christ's divinity joined him in his baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, and then the divinity departed from him when he went to the cross. This was called Serenthianism, named after its founder. Well, these ideas continue to develop into the second and third century. There's several of these heresies, modalism and, and so on and so forth. But theology forms worldview which impacts thinking and ultimately behavior. And so people in the first century began to act out of this false theology in two extremely opposite ways. Because they believed that matter was evil and the only redeemable part of them, the good part of them was the spirit, they began to, to behave in one of two ways. The first way was an aesthetic way. They, they viewed that matter was evil and so they needed to subjugate their bodies and rein them in because our bodies are evil. And so they would practice self-flagellation. They would even in some cases emasculate themselves. They would beat their bodies. They would fast relentlessly because they had to rein in the evil that was their bodies. It led to this extremely uh, self-deprecating, like a harmful way of living. But the opposite, you know, and I wonder if these two groups ever talk to each other. The opposite view is completely, completely opposite in terms of behavior. They saw that because their bodies were already just evil intrinsically, but the spirit was good, and since their decisions come from their consciousness, which is not part of their physical bodies, they kind of determined that, therefore, it doesn't matter what we do with our bodies. There's no moral consequence. And so they lived with complete immoral license and participated in all manner of, of orgies and drunkenness and all kinds of crazy stuff. And so it is interesting that while theology forms worldview and changes thinking and then behavior, here you had two diametrically opposed uh, responses of behavior, both which were completely false and completely wrong. And this is in ancient times. By the way, this isn't that far from how people respond in the world today uh, to understanding the material world and to our bodies and so on and so forth. Now, let's see if we can start to pull all this together. Uh, things like secular humanism or its uh, its predecessor, materialism, naturalism, are kind of seen to be things that take a high view of the material universe, right? Because those philosophies believe that the material world is all that exists. The things that I can touch and put my hands on exist. Things like love and romance and religion and values and morals. In fact, today it's argued are simply just synapses in the mind. They're chemical reactions. They're not real in the, in the sense, in the scientific sense. And so while those philosophies seem to elevate the material world, they actually devalue it. How so? Those philosophies teach us a view that, that the material world, and specifically the human person, is simply a machine. We're simply a collection of molecules. We're simply a, a mechanism. And there is no intrinsic value. There's no higher purpose in, 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 of being. We're just part of some impersonal process of macro evolution. We've come from nowhere and we're going to nowhere. Well, C.S. Lewis, as far back as the 1960s, saw this really clearly and he said this, the Christian and the materialist hold different beliefs about the universe. They can't both be right. Now, we haven't, talked at the, we haven't looked at the Christian view yet. 
But he said this, he said, the one who is wrong will act in a way which simply doesn't fit the real universe. This is a huge point. This is really our, uh, the C.S. Lewis test of which philosophy is correct. He says, you want to measure whether a philosophy of life and understanding a, a theology of the body is correct? Does it fit the world we live in? Measure it against that. So again, our big point this morning is we believe that a biblical worldview provides a better way for us to engage both with ourselves and each other in our, in our world. Well, that brings us to God's grand design. We've talked a lot about, we've looked at these diagrams, we're talking philosophy. I want to look now at God's grand, grand design. And you know, this week, when I was preparing for today, I got to this point in my preparation and I read this text, just, it was just me in a quiet room, and I was overcome with a sense of the majesty of God's design. And so I want to read just four verses of the Genesis account of creation. And we've talked a lot about Nancy Piercy's book and other sources and Francis Schaeffer and philosophy. We are now reading the words of Almighty God, so I'm going to ask that we stand together as we do that. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. You can go ahead and sit. Brothers and sisters, there should be a notable contrast when we read of God's grand design. It's the only place in the, in the creation account that says that God saw that it was very good. And I was struck this week of a, a couple of things. Number one, how there's just this sense of shalom, wholeness about the way that God creates, what he says about who we are and the design and how he made us. And it says that God creates out of the place of a pre-existing eternal relationship of fellowship between the Godhead. Get this, God didn't need to create us. God from eternity past already had perfect fellowship within the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But he creates out of a sense of delight. And one of the other profound things that struck me so heavily this week is at the instant of creation, it repeats it twice in the Genesis account, there was instantly purpose and mission and meaning and partnership with God in the creative act. It's the complete opposite of what we see as we really view how the world looks at our humanity and the sense of purpose, i.e. there is none. In the Greek, it's the word telos, which means ultimate meaning. In the moment of creation, not at some future point, God puts uh, humanity on the ground, as it were, also capable of fellowship within and among themselves and with himself. Right? He creates them, the text says, male and female, in relationship to God, and he creates them with purpose immediately. That's huge for our understanding of who we are. God saw that it was very good. Nancy Piercy in, in her book says this, the Bible proclaims profound value and dignity in the creation, including the human body, as the handiwork of God. She says, Scripture treats body and soul rather as two sides of the same coin. The inner life of the soul is expressed through the outer life of our bodies. This is the way that the psalmist talks about his own identity and his body as he relates to his God. Listen to Psalm 63. God, you are my God. I eagerly seek you. I thirst for you. My body faints for you in a land that is dry, desolate, and without water. Psalm 44. For we have sunk down to the dust. Our bodies have clung to the ground. Proverbs 4. Don't lose sight of the Lord's teaching. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. 
While the psalmist on the one hand distinguishes his body, he uses both body and pronoun as, as uh, synonymous identifiers for who he is. And guess what? So do we as we live our daily lives. When you eat, you don't say my face is eating or my mouth is eating. You say, I am eating. When you injure yourself, while you might describe where you were injured, you ultimately will say, I was hurt. I was injured. Again, C.S. Lewis's measure. The view that is wrong will not measure and respond to the world that we live in. This idea of personhood theory versus God's grand design has implications for how we live our daily experience. And again, the case we're making this morning that God's way, a biblical worldview, gives us a better way. So I want to look at this. You know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, outside of practical language here this morning. I want to talk about this and, and look at it in a for instance this morning, looking at uh, personhood theory versus a biblical worldview or a teleological worldview to humanity in the, for instance, of the issue of abortion. Now, abortion, specifically spe speaking, isn't a topic of sexuality, but it's certainly related to our sexuality. And let me say this, while there are exceptions, largely within the world around us, largely within the world, abortion today is little more than birth control. Okay, that's just the fact. That doesn't mean every instance is that, but that's what it's become. And so how did we get there? Well, personhood theory gives us a window into that. And I want to uh, share some of that with you this morning as a for instance. In other words, I want to show that this theory actually fleshes out in real life in the world that we live in. So Joseph Fletcher, who's a former Episcopal priest, espouses personhood theory when speaking about abortion. He says this. He says, what is critical is personal status, not merely human status. So there it is. There's the true story view. In other words, to be human biologically is a scientific fact, but to be a person is an ethical concept. This is what our world believes today. You can see this uh, on the screen visually represented in this next diagram. Personhood is how we measure ourselves, how we define ourselves, the ethos of who we are. It's the part that has legal standing. But the body is, becomes expendable. So accordingly, a fetus, quote unquote, becomes a baby or a person then at some undetermined point in time. By the way, every person from the secular point of view who's in on the conversation about when does personhood begin. Every professor, every doctor, even every clergy, every philosopher has a different opinion about when that point is. None of them agree. But nearly every one of them will agree, listen, that it does not occur, personhood does not occur in utero. And so the discussion comes when after gestation does a human being become a person? Uh, Joseph Fletcher, alarmingly, this is his answer, suggested 15 qualities to define when human life is worthy of honor and protection. 15 qualities. Now, I'm not going to list them all. I want to share just a few. And as you listen, think about the life of an infant and at which point you think they would attain these qualities. 15 of them, we'll just look at a couple. Intelligence, self-awareness, self-control, a sense of time, concern for others, Listen, I have teenagers who aren't still yet concerned about others. <laughs> Curiosity. And so should a subject being evaluated measure too low in any one of those categories, they're not a person. That's literally what, what's being applied here to the science, as it were. Princeton professor of bioethics, Peter Singer, said this. He said, the notion that human life is sacred just because it is human life is medieval. Now, Singer was the one who infamously said, and I've shared this from the pulpit before, human babies are not born self-aware or are capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons, period. But animals are self-aware, and therefore the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. You see, our theology f informs our worldview which then affects how we think and how we behave. Now, it's possible you might be thinking, well, that's, that's academia, that's philosophy, that's, not, that's people with big heads and keyboards like wrestling with each other over these ideas. Kind of a funny image, by the way. But let's look at it in everyday life. 
through the lens of a woman and a woman who has, who has had children. A cultural commentator and author, Mary Elizabeth Williams, shared this about her own convictions. She said, I believe that life starts at conception. Throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. So this is a woman who's birthed children and believes that life begins at conception. By the way, if you're still arguing in the larger culture that life begins at conception, you can stop arguing that. The culture has fully conceded that. It's now about personhood, not life. The discussion has shifted. That, by the way, has a lot to do with the advances in ultrasound technology and science because the science, well, you get the idea. So here's a woman who says life begins at conception. She knows that. She goes on. A fetus can be a human life without having the same rights as the woman in whose body it resides. She's the boss. Her life and what is right for her circumstances and her health should automatically trump the rights of the, listen, non-autonomous entity inside of her. Always. The fetus is indeed a life. It is a life worth sacrificing. Now, let me just say this. We're, we're, I'm going to jump the gun a little bit on where we're ending this morning. This is opposite of the gospel, right? The gospel says that creator God comes and dies for his creatures. The gospel says that a servant is not greater than his master, that we are even in our marriages to die to ourselves, to serve the other. This is, this is a, a power dynamic. I want to make a pastoral point here this morning because I don't want you to hear judgment or condemnation. We're talking about applying truth in the theoretical to life in the everyday. If I opened this morning sharing how sexual brokenness touched my life and impacted me, if abortion is something that has touched your life and impacted you, this church is here to love and give care and to serve you, and to help you work through that. There's no judgment here. And so as we wrestle with truth, I, I don't want that to come across condemning or hurtful or devoid of feeling. I recognize that these are emotionally laced issues, and you may have experienced that in your life. So you might find these statements shocking and disturbing. You might actually agree with them. There's probably in a group this big and those watching online, it's likely that there are some of you that actually agree with those statements. And I will say that for Peter Singer and Mary Elizabeth Williams and others who think that way, they're actually following the logic of this worldview of personhood theory correctly. Uh, Nancy Piercy drives home this point. She's a little graphic here, but she's making the point that theology forms worldview, which impacts how we think and behave. She says the implication is that as long as the preborn child is deemed to be human but not a person, it's just a disposable piece of matter, a natural resource like timber or corn. It could be used for research and experiments, tinkered with genetically, harvested for organs, and then disposed of with other medical waste. The core question in abortion then is the status of the human body. Is the human body an integral part of the person, sharing in its dignity, or is it extrinsic to the person, a piece of matter that we can control and manipulate any way we want? You see, personhood theory forces us to ask really awkward questions about our sense of being that nobody agrees on what the answers are, to say it frankly. It's interesting that the science actually favors a teleological, a purpose view of our humanity. It's a view that doesn't devalue us as, as people. It's a view that says the only prerequisite, the only criteria for being uh, a person is to be born a human, is to be conceived as a human, even. So on the one hand, the implications of one view are confusion and a lack of agreement to when personhood begins, when life has value that is worth protecting. The implications of a biblical view or a teleological view are what have led Christians through the centuries to rescue babies off the garbage piles in ancient Rome or to shield and hide the disabled and the special needs early in the Nazi movement from being exterminated or today to go into all the world into every natural disaster, every point of crisis, and to intervene and, and serve at great cost to themselves all kinds of people in great need. 
You see, each person, the Bible teaches and we believe, holds intrinsic value as an embodied soul, an image bearer of the Godhead. Yes, marred by sin, but longing for restoration rather than destined to just anonymous destruction. Okay, so what about when it concerns our sexuality? How does the disagreement between personhood theory and a biblical worldview uh, of humanity play out between the sheets, to use a crass idiom? We're going to look at what the Bible says, but we'll also look at what the data says. What does sociology say sex is for? And why and how does a biblical worldview, our big point this morning, provide a better way to engage with ourselves and our world? That's why we've entitled this series, Good Sex. A biblical look at delight, desire, and design. We are excited to preach these messages genuinely because it's an opportunity to be truthful and I hope compassionate and gracious at the same time. So we're going to look at four topics. Next week, Pastor Zach will help us wrestle through the idea of hookup culture and pornography. And the following week, we'll talk about homosexuality and heterosexuality. Then we'll, talk, we'll have a conversation about gender and transgenderism specifically. And finally, we'll look at marriage. Today's time is meant to undergird support and give us a sense of understanding that there are two ways to approach this and they impact how we think and how we behave. In my yard, there is a half-dead tree. One side of the tree is flourishing. It grows a full canopy of leaves. It drops acorns. The other side of the tree is completely dead, regularly, routinely dropping branches that are completely dead and actually rotting where it stands. And like this tree, on the life-giving side, there are many truths even within the cultural narrative that drive even people's passionate defense of the LGBTQ cause. Like some of the responses to what I saw that day on the road, things like love, identity, personal dignity, free choice, fellowship, friendship. Those are things worth pursuing. But like the half-dead side of the tree, there are lies that lead to death. Things like my sex is my identity or my sexuality is my identity. Like, who I love will complete me or must complete me. Like, my body, my choice. Like, biological sex is not a determiner of my gender identity at all. And others. We'll touch on these week by week. But here's the deal. The tree in my backyard will eventually die. In fact, it's interesting. Yesterday, as I was looking at it, I noticed that the death from one side is moving into the other. It, the disease is not eradicated. It, we can't get rid of it. The tree's going to die. But that's not true with the ideologies and untruths of the two-story view. That's the miracle of the gospel. By injecting gospel truth, the whole tree can live again. In fact, the Psalms grab this exact metaphor. Listen to how powerful and profound this is. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose life, uh, leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. This is the framework from which we're saying God's plan is a better plan. It's because God's plan, as we saw in the creation narrative, is a plan of flourishing and a plan of life and a plan of our best good, a plan of purpose and hope and meaning, a plan of telos. So I want to end this morning where we began. Because the claim that we're making about, when we talk about being human, about being man and woman, the claim about our sexuality is that the gospel is that better way and does provide ultimate hope. But what do I mean by that? The gospel can be summarized very succinctly as we look at the whole council of scripture in four big movements called the big story or meta narrative. And each one points us to Christ. Each one is designed to point us to the ultimate, to Jesus Christ. In the creation narrative, which is the first movement of God's big story, John's gospel tells us that Jesus was the principal agent before time began in our creation. The second movement of the meta narrative of God's redemptive drama of people is the fall of man into rebellion and sin, 
where God clothes his people, covering their sin, and where the first promise of Christ comes in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right in the chapter that, it, that, that encapsulates and talks about our rebellion, God immediately provides a solution, and Christ is that solution. The third movement is redemption, which is the cross itself. The means of our redemption, of our salvation, is Christ's cross. And finally, his resurrection points us to and ushers in newness and restoration, which is the final movement of the meta narrative of God's great drama. Well, how is all this? How is the gospel? How is the incarnation? How is Jesus the answer? to understanding that we are embodied souls. Hebrews 10, Jesus says this. He says, you did not desire sacrifice and offering, but you prepared a body for me. Then I said, Jesus is talking here from Isaiah's uh, prophecy of Isaiah. See, it is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. By this will, which is God's plan of salvation, we, God's people, have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. In Peter's first letter, he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why did Jesus Christ come physically as a baby, as a human being at Bethlehem? Why did Jesus Christ die physically on a cross and not just atone for our sins in some spiritual manner? Why did Jesus Christ raise to life in his body, albeit a glorified new body? There's two reasons. Because we are embodied souls. Romans 8 tells us the entire creation groans under the the curse of sin, the the material world. And so the second reason is because Jesus entered real life. God came as one of us, walked where we walk, lived this life. Hebrews says that he knows your hardship. He knows your trial. He knows your temptation. This means that if you've been damaged, hurt, or traumatized by expressions of sexual brokenness, Jesus knows. It means that if you wrestle privately in this world of dark temptation and struggle with your sexual brokenness, he knows. It means that if you've done things with your body for which you're ashamed that you know are wrong, he knows and all hope is not lost. The gospel is a message leading to that ultimate telos, to redemption and restoration, full restoration. That's the precise point of the gospel is that Christ comes to bring hope where there's despair. And sexual brokenness in particular has reaped despair in so many lives. Final quote, Nancy Piercy says this. When a cheap trinket is broken, we toss it aside without a second thought. Think personhood theory. But when a priceless work of art is destroyed, we are heartbroken The reason that sin is so tragic is that it destroys a human being, a priceless masterpiece that reflects the character of the supreme artist. So I want to leave you one final image, one final illustration to carry with us through all five weeks. As we've looked at theological anthropology, as we've looked at who we are as human beings, and as we start to look at our sexuality more explicitly this next month, The biblical worldview says that we are the masterpiece and pinnacle of God's creation, but it's a flawed masterpiece. And so that's the image we'll ask you to hold in front of you as we we wrestle through each of these topics. Where do we see the masterpiece of God, his his dignity, his honor, the beauty of his design, purpose, and so on and so forth, but also see that it's flawed, broken, and corrupted? And how do we recover a biblical image? And then how do we engage our world on behalf of these ideas? in all love and truth and grace. That's our endeavor for the next month. Pray with me this morning. Father, we just thank you this morning. Lord, we've wrestled with some big things. And Lord, I would ask that principally and above all else, 
that through everything that I've shared this morning that we would see Jesus. Amen.